nice to sing a psalm like that and then follow that up this week by reading Psalm 23. <laughs> See how that uh, applies to me, right? It's a wonderful psalm based upon Psalm 23. How God leads us through our life and through tough times, through the valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil. However, we find ourselves tonight, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we just finished where uh, we've gone through, really, two, three full chapters of talking about Christian liberty. What that means, how I should apply it to my life, what I should do with Christian liberty, and really the end is just thinking about others first, right? Not putting myself in front of everybody else and doing what, what in the world I want to do because I'm free in Christ to do it, but thinking of others because we want to see many, verse number 33 of chapter 10, that may be saved. That's really what we're here for, right? Our life can be a shining example of God now. Of course, we're here to give glory to God, but if we shine forth in that glory and in that light and we do things in a way that's putting others first, we might see others come to know the Lord as their personal Savior, right? And then in verse chapter 11, verse number 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. So that really kind of goes with uh, chapter 10, right? I'm going to follow Christ, and as I do that, you follow Christ too. Not that... Uh, Paul has any uh, um, great thing that he's doing. It's, I'm going to follow Christ, and in those areas where I follow Christ, you do the same. Now, remember, as we came to that subject, it's really the church in Corinth asking Paul questions, isn't it? And Paul has responded by giving his answers through the power of the Holy Spirit to the questions that they have. So this is a going to be a very practical thing that we see here. Um, we might wrestle with what the Bible says here in my own human flesh. I really kind of wanted to say something different, but that's not what we do, right? We read the words of God. We see what it says. We apply them to our lives because in the end, God's ways are higher than my ways. I don't understand the mind, the mind of God. I don't quite understand the way things are exactly. We just faithfully Obey, because as we discovered this morning, the Word of God is uh, God-breathed. These are the words straight from God. The role of men and women in today's day and age aren't really clearly defined anymore, are they? I mean, when you start asking people in our government to define a woman and they can't, then the role certainly can't be defined anymore, right? Or, I'm certain they can define it. They just don't want to because they don't want to be put into a corner. So if we don't even know what a woman is anymore, how can we define what their role is? How can we define the role of a man? And when you start introducing transitionary uh, people in between men and women and women and men and people call themselves binary or whatever, call themselves all kinds of different things, now they're sexless. Um, you know, what are their roles then? <laughs> well, we find ourselves in a place where Satan is always attacking, has always attacked, will always attack, anything that God has established, anything that God has set forth. And I think as you look over the course of time, you see it come in waves. Satan seems to be able to get a foothold in one area, and so the world runs with it, and the church hopefully stands against it. We find ourselves in a, time, in a day and age right now where this seems to be a, an issue where we don't even know what a lady is anymore in our world. We know, if you know the words of God, pretty easily to define it, but that's where we're at. When we talk about society, there's always two basic factors, if you will. There's authority and there's submission. We have authority everywhere we look, whether we like it or not. Whether you're male or female, there's authority everywhere, isn't there? I mean, if I'm driving down the road, and I think one time I had a police officer pull me over for a 
completely ridiculous reason. I think I did nothing more than make him mad, and he was there to exert his authority over me uh, because he wanted to drive 100 miles an hour, and I didn't want to. <laughs> Somehow, some way, I ended up with a citation, and he didn't, even though he was driving at those speeds. Little did he know that I uh, went to college with the post commander's kids, so I called him, and we had a nice long discussion. I didn't end up with a citation in the end. I don't know what they did with him, but you know, that's kind of the way it is, right? People have authority, and in that situation, I just had to take it. He told me everything I did wrong, even though I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was obeying the speed limit, I was obeying the signs around me, and he wasn't. But he had authority over me at that time, and gave me the citation there at the side of the road. And that's the way the world is, right? You have authority, and you have submission. In that situation, I submitted. I did not throw a fit. I did not tell him anything that I knew. I just went along with it and drove along my merry way and uh, took care of things later. But that's the way it is wherever we go. Rules of the road, rules at work. No matter how far you work your way up the ladder, there's still someone else to answer to, isn't there? And even if you're Donald Trump and own everything in the world, there's still someone else to answer to, isn't there? <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Even if you're the President of the United States, you have a lot to answer for. God's design is men authority, women submission. We're going to show that here. But we don't want to take that too far. We don't want to make it sound like I'm a male chauvinist. And I don't want to make it sound like it's anything other than what is presented here. Because along with that comes great responsibility. And there's great significance in what is here. This, by the way, is generally speaking about spirit. You know, the reality is, if you go to a workplace, you might have a lady as your boss. I have a lady that's one of my bosses. So how does that all fit in too, right? <laughs> With everything. I'm going to share what the Bible says. Not my opinion. You shouldn't care about my opinion anyways. <laughs> People, by the way, read this. Claim that Paul is nothing more than a male chauvinistic pig. He People will claim that uh, Paul had a bad relationship with his mom, as if they could even know. And so the end result with the bad relationship with his mom, he writes these kinds of things down. They'll also say that he probably had a girlfriend and she burned him, and so he hates ladies, and so this is what he writes down, which of course is insanity. You can learn that in churches today, by the way. We're going to start with the distinction. And... That is going to be about this role that is assigned, and, and it really builds the framework of our, of our society. By the way, if you work a job, is your boss superior over you? Is your boss smarter than you? Is your boss better than you? Not necessarily, right? And in many cases, I would say that the bosses need to learn a lot from their employees, don't they? Mm -hmm. There's a lot that the employees have to offer, and the bosses just look right over it and do idiotic things. So just because they're in a place of authority doesn't mean that they're intellectually smarter, doesn't mean that they have anything over you. It just simply means that they've been placed in that position. And by the way, when we start talking about this, and we start talking about uh, authority and submission, when it comes to spiritual things, we are all equal. Now, I believe it's the man's role to bring the spiritual things into the family and be a spiritual leader. But when it comes to our relationship with God, ladies don't have to go through a man to get to God. You have direct access to the throne room of God just like a man does. You can grow despite a man <laughs> or because or, or be helped along by a man. Because in some cases, 
And in many cases, men don't want to have anything to do with spiritual things. And a lady wants to have a wonderful relationship with God and might be the only spiritual leader in a household. So just because God has laid things out this way doesn't mean that's the way it always goes. And it doesn't mean that the man is better than a woman. By the way, nowadays, and if I even take it even a little bit further, all the man has is a different title, especially in a workplace. In a church, you have elders and you have deacons. Are the elders better than a deacon? No. Does it mean that an elder is more spiritual than a deacon? Not necessarily. Does it mean that your pastor is the most spiritual person in the whole place? Not necessarily. <laughs> They're not spiritually superior. They just have different functions. Men and women, just because a man might be the head of a household doesn't mean they're superior. They just have different functions, different things to do. What does scripture have to say about some of this stuff, by the way? It's so, despite what we've just read, we'll get into that. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want you to see something here. Notice today I, get to, I got to keep turning to 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Eventually I'll get there. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, be won by the con conversion, the conversation of the wives. Pretty simple statement, right? Wives be in subjection to their own husbands, even if he's an unbeliever. What's the main reason for that? You obey what the Bible says. They'll see God in you. They'll see that you love them. They'll see that you're doing your part. That conversation might lead into other conversations, which may, which may lead into them coming to know the Lord as their personal Savior, right? But, verse number 7, go all the way down to verse number 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What are husbands to do? Try to understand their wives. Live with them. Honor them. Recognize that they're the, the, the jewel of their crown. He is to keep her pure. He is to keep her chaste. He is to keep her holy. He has a great responsibility as a head. And by the way, many of you have worked in a workplace and you've uttered these words, they can't pay me enough money to work that job. The head of our human resources, I've said it about her, you couldn't pay me enough money to take her job. <laughs> you, you could pay me a million dollars a second. I don't want her job. It's a miserable job trying to deal with all of the nonsense of how our employees Rockford has. I mean, I have 60 alone just there in the bus garage. Take every, you know, 14 buildings. We have thousands of employees. There, there's a problem happening every minute that she has to squash out. You can't pay me enough. Guess what? When you're placed as the head of something, there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of things that you have to do because you're supposed to be the authority. In many cases, men drop the ball. And that's a sad thing. But they shouldn't. So what's one of the things that he is to do as being the authority? Dwell with them according to knowledge. Get to know who they are. Get to know their desires. Get to know the things that, uh, that they want to do you know, spiritually or in life or whatever it is. And help them achieve those things. And help her grow spiritually in all of those things. She's the weaker vessel, it says, so you're the muscle behind it all. You're the one to help get her there. And then it says when you do that, 
and as being heirs together of the grace of life. What's the grace of life? You're heirs together of the grace of life. That's enjoying God's wonderful design in marriage. That's really what that is. So what do you have? You have submission in verse number 1. Go down to verse number 7. Because of the weaker vessel. So that places great responsibility upon the man. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, you have women in subjection, man in authority, women not to teach, women to learn. Some say that that was just cultural, but I'll tell you it's not just cultural. Because in verse 13 of that chapter, in 1 Timothy, it's how God made humans and designed them. So go back to 1 Corinthians then. Kind of lay that as some groundwork. The husband is to be a spiritual leader. Lady comes along, has a question. Husband doesn't know the Bible, doesn't have the answers. It's hard for her to do her part if he doesn't do his part, isn't it? It's hard for her to join in when she's the one that's doing all the heavy lifting and he's the one that's supposed to be doing all the heavy lifting. And this was, this was a problem in the church in Corinth and they must have asked about it. So now comes this question. Paul starts off in verse number 2. Let's, let's get there. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. He says, I praise that you remember me. I can't believe that you do, but thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for asking me questions. <laughs> thank you for you know, being involved with my life. I praise you for that. Remember the word brethren has great uh, endearment terms. Uh, you know, I, I love you guys. Thank you for remembering me in all things. And keeping the ordinances. I am praising you that you are keeping the ordinances. You are taking what the Word of God says or what has been revealed to you at that point in time, and you're keeping them. Now, the church in Corinth really wasn't. <laughs> but there were some things that they were, right? They're still believers. They're still trying to learn. They're still trying to go. Paul is trying to set them straight. So he says, I praise you when you do those things. I praise you when you follow the words of God. And then he says as I delivered them to you. That is very strong. I gave you doctrine. I gave you ordinances. You started following them. Keep up the good work. I'm giving you some more things to do here. Unfortunately, he had to write 2 Corinthians too because it didn't stick. <laughs> they had some more work to do when they hit 2 Corinthians. Verse number 3 then says, but. So after Paul praises them, he gets the word, but. But I would have you know that the head of every woman, or that, that, that the head of every man is Christ. Principle is given. Man is subject to God. And then later on there, he says, and the, and, and the head of every man is Christ, and the head of, every, of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So you kind of have this laid out, right? Man is subject to God. Woman is subject to man. If a man does not submit to Christ, what happens? He's lost. He's not a believer. Or he is a believer and judgment falls on him. There's great punishment to be had when man is not subject to Christ. What happens if a woman does not submit in family then? We follow these principles right through, don't we? It's not different. If a man does not subject himself to Christ, there's punishment. If a lady does not subject herself to the head of the house, there's punishment. Punishment doesn't come from the man, by the way. <laughs> Some men think that they're the ones that should usher the punishment, don't they? It's wrong. 
it, it, it's not right. Let God deal with that. And, and if you think, you know, my wife has gone off and gone crazy and I need to do something about her, let God deal with it. You do your part, you continue to do your part, you always do your part, let God deal with it. Especially if we're talking about getting physical. It's not right, it's wrong, nor in the Bible do we see a man striking women for those types of things. Right? And that's where some men take it. Man must recognize then that God has given him authority. He has to accept it and take it. And you know what he must do then? He must rule for God, not for himself. Which is where the problem usually comes in for the man, doesn't it? You're going to do what I say, how I say, whenever I say it, because I want it. That's ruling for self. And if this thing gets totally disrupted, in many cases, it's the man that is taking his authority completely out of context. I'm the ruler, you're the subject, and you do exactly what I want. Whereas the Bible really talks about something completely different, right? <laughs> it talks about him understanding her, having knowledge about her, building her up, keeping her chaste, keeping her pure. And the Bible, as always, talks about putting others first. And when men do that, I think ladies easily then want to do their part as the man leads the way that God has designed. Then, and here's the other part. Look at what comes after that. And the head of Christ is God. So that's interesting, isn't it? You have the head of man is Christ, and at the end, you have the head of Christ is God. What if Christ didn't subject himself to God? What if Christ refused the authority of God? What would happen? How did Christ obey? To the point of death, didn't he? He did what God the Father asked of him, always. Did Christ always want to do what God the Father asked of him? That's a good question, isn't it? What did Christ say in the Garden of Gethsemane? If this cup can pass from me, let it be so. Can there be another way for me to pay for mankind. And God said, no, didn't he? And let me tell you, what, what did Christ do? He sweat great drops of blood, didn't he? I mean, he was so worked up over carrying the weight of the world's sins upon his back, which he knew no sin. He didn't know anything about sin. And now he's going to have all that placed upon him and have this separation between him and God while that happens. He didn't want to do it. But he obeyed. And he put mankind first, didn't he? Well, that's really the example, isn't it? So here you have modern people that don't want what the Bible says to be true. You can go all the way back to the feminist movement, go right on through, can't you? To, till today, where we don't even know what the difference is between a man and a woman. Which just, that makes me laugh whenever I say that, Chris. It's so crazy in my head that we're there. And what the modern church has done is place women in authority and done all kinds of things because they say that this can't be the way that it's written because Paul is a male chauvinist. Well, I think God purposely put it between these two things. Because if you're going to throw that portion away, why do we obey the first part and the last part? Why do we think those should be true? How, how can God be the head of man if we're not willing to say that the next statement is true? How can God be the head of Christ if we're not willing to say that the statement in between the two isn't true? They got it gooped up. They, they messed something up. 
Well, God didn't mess anything up. It's there. It's plain. It's simple. But yet it goes very deep, doesn't it? And by the way, Jesus loved his church. He gave himself for it. The church is his subject. How did he love his subject? To the point of dying for them, didn't he? God loved the Son. What did God say about his Son? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. That's your authority right there. You have authority to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Well, that's not the type of authority that I grew up in my Baptist church learning. <laughs> that's the authority that God is talking about here. I'll also tell you this. It says that the head of Christ is God. So God is the authority, Christ is the subject. Is Christ lesser than God the Father? Absolutely not. They are the same. They are equal. Christ said, I and the Father are one. Who's the head of the church? Christ. Authority, subject, relation. I, as a member of the Church of Christ, am I inferior to Christ? That's a good question, isn't it? The answer is no. I see Rick shaking his head. He's got it right. The answer is no. I'm not inferior to Christ. What did God say about the Church? We are joint heirs with Christ. Man is the head of the wife. Is she inferior to him? Absolutely not by any sense of the imagination. These are simply roles. And churches that deny these roles, deny that they should be there, they're throwing away everything. They might as well just pick up their Bible and throw it away. They are denying the authority of Scripture. I don't want it to be that way. Guess what? If I had to write this, I wouldn't write it this way. And it would be so inferior to what God has done and what God is doing because this wraps it all up, all up in an amazing, beautiful way and my way would simply just be my selfishness. So after he tells you about it, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Then we start applying the principle. Now here comes something interesting. <laughs> Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. What does that mean? <laughs> All right, let me, tell you, let me tell you what's going on in this day. You can go back, you can read all of the things about it. You can see what the Romans were doing. You can see what's happening in the church in Corinth. You can see what's happening in the surrounding area of Corinth. We just got done with the discussion about Christian liberty. In America, we might be free to wear a sleeveless dress, right? Nothing wrong with that. Go to Guyana, South America. I don't know if this is true anymore. But way back when, when I was in high school, 1989-1990, the prostitutes wore a sleeveless dress. When we as Christians showed up, we were told, don't bring your sleeveless dresses. Even though we were on the equator and it was, you know, 200 degrees every day with 5,000% humidity, ladies did not wear a sleeveless dress, nor did they wear slacks. Culture, right? So all these girls had to show up with dresses and not be sleeveless. And they were hot all the time. <laughs> and one year we went down there and our luggage didn't show up. So all the girls changed their dresses every day. That was funny. Anyways, there's some cultural things going on here. About Christian liberty. 
and about men and women. It was cultural for a lady to cover her head. Sound like some places in the world today, isn't it? If you covered your head, you were saying, I'm taken, I'm not interested in any other man, I belong to my husband. Leave me alone. I'm his. If you took that veil off, it meant you were available and looking. And it also was very probable that you were a prostitute in their culture. Now, the second part of that is cut hair. There were some things going on in their time, too, with gender. And there were some ladies that wanted to be like men, and they cut their hair to look like men's hair. And they were taking their veils off because they were uh, rejecting society and going against society and trying to pave their own path. Sounds very interesting in today's comparison, isn't it? <laughs> the other thing that would happen was they might shave their head completely. Again, a prostitute. No veil, shaved head, that's a prostitute. You're a guy, you're looking, there you go. Now, part of the thing, too, like today, we don't wear veils around America, do we? But you know what? A lady can dress modestly, and a lady can dress that says, Hey guys, look at me, right? It can happen. And so it's really digging into some of those types of issues. So when it says here, Every man praying or prophesying, and really when we pray or prophesy, what are we doing? We're talking to God or we're having God speak through us, right? That's what the praying or the prophesying is. That's communion with God in amazing ways. If his head is covered... He dishonoreth his head. There were some men that were trying to be effeminate. They were trying to say, oh, I want to be like a lady. And he's pointing directly at that. And there's no doubt about it, that's, uh, uh, that's not even up for discussion in these passages of Scripture. That's what was happening. It's amazing how 2,000 years later, we're going through the exact same thing, right? He says, if you're a man, don't be dressed like a lady. And then praying to God and prophesying. It doesn't go hand in hand. Don't do it. What's that say to a lot of our churches today that are you've seen all over the TV with their their affirming yeah, of what's going on? Then it says, Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Listen, ladies, it's their culture. You don't have to put a prayer shawl on and go to prayer, okay? That's, that's not what these verses are telling you to do. <laughs> you can pray with your head uncovered nowadays. It's fine. But he's saying if there's cultural norms about how you're presenting yourself to others around you, you know, don't do that. Don't get involved with all this craziness that's going on around us today doesn't make any sense. You will dishonor your head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. You know what? If you're going to take that shawl off your head, might as well just shave it. And that, and that really there is talking about cutting it there, I think, in that situation. Might as well just go full bolt. Because the next, the, the next verse there in verse number 6, For if, if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Oh, the first one shaved, right? Because yeah. that was, they had to do with the prostitute. So that was take your shawl off, which is what a prostitute might do. Shave your head just like a prostitute. He says, you know what? If, if you're not going to do those things, then you might as well just cut your hair too. Either be all in for the Lord or just go all the other way so that everybody knows that you're not of God. Don't get the two goofed up. Don't get the two messed up. Because I'll tell you, what, what does the Bible say about a fence setter? He, that's what God said about them, right? I spew you out of my mouth. God would rather that you be show, uh, showing that you are all for God and, and doing everything for God and living your life for God or he'd rather you just be 
living a full life of sin. That's basically what he's saying there. The ones that sit on the fence and say, well, you know, I like doing some of this, and I like doing some of this, and I spit you out of my mouth. Well, that's basically what he's saying here, too. Don't sit on the fence. Don't pretend to be a Christian. And then look like the world. And act like the world and present yourself as if you're, you're, you're free for any man to have. Don't do it. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So you know, if that's a shame, then you should just cover yourself as your culture dictates. Why? Why is all that brought up? Well, 1, verse 33 of chapter 10. It's going to be hard to witness to others if you look exactly like the world. And then two, it's not how God designed the roles of a man and a woman. And by the way, one of the things I didn't hit on here, just in closing, why has God set it up this way? One, you can't have two bosses, right? You get too many bosses, what, what's, the, what's the old saying? If you get too many chiefs, there's a lot of problems, right? But two, God made man first and then he made woman. And so it's just the natural progression of how that is. And that's the only reason, I believe, they put man in charge, if you will. But along with it comes great responsibility that should make uh, any lady say, Whoo, I'm glad I get to sit back and let God deal with him. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the one that has to take the responsibility for my whole family. I'm glad if I just line up underneath him and punishment comes, it lands on his head. If I'm underneath the veil of protection because I'm doing my part. It's a wonderful position to be in. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this lesson you gave to us today. I know it's a tough subject and sometimes I read this stuff and it, go against, it goes against what my flesh wants to say. And it goes against uh, uh, many times how uh, I want things to be. But we simply read the words of God. Trust that your ways are greater than my way. And then when we put it all together, what a beautiful thing it turns into. Father, I just pray that as we contemplate how we can take this information, go out into our world and live our lives in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you, filled with your spirit, I pray, Lord, that we can truly be used of you in tremendous ways. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have a closing song.